morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day for uh, to the workshop on S2S science, which is being held as part of the 2021 ASP Summer Colloquium on S2S science and applications. Um, so uh, today's um, opening speaker is Andrew Robertson, um, who is a senior senior research scientist and um, heads the R IRI climate group. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor in the Department um, of Earth Environmental Sciences and uh, uh, teaches as such. Um, most importantly, he's a co-chair um, uh, for the uh, WMO S2S um, um, project and is also heavily involved with SUBEX, which is the American extension of the S2S efforts uh, using additional models. Andrew, welcome, and we're looking very forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Judith, for the kind invitation and for the nice introduction. Uh, so, sharing my screen. Can you see that on full screen now? Yeah. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, great. So what I thought I would do is to talk about some of our, our real-time uh, sub-seasonal forecasting that we've been doing at the IRI. Uh, and some of my collaborators here are Jing Wan, Angel Munoz, and, and Boha Singh. And uh, so the outline will be to show you some of these calibrated uh, probabilistic sub-seasonal rainfall and temperature forecasts based on sub-X models. So as, as Judith was saying, uh, we are involved in, in the sub-X uh, project uh, too. And the nice thing about those models for us at IRI is that they are available in real time, those forecasts. So I'll, I'll talk about that. And so it has to do with, you know, uh, calibration, uh, multi-model ensembling, and, you know, crucially, uh, probabilistic forecasts. You know, what can we get out of, what can we do for, for sub-seasonal scales uh, for those? And then secondly, I'll, I'll show you some of our tools that we've been, develop, we've been developing for uh, looking at forecasts in terms of weather regimes, and that'll be over the, the North Pacific uh, Western US. So to set the context, I just put this one in. Uh, I was looking, it's actually up on my wall, this slide, it, it, it's this, this graphic. It's one of IRI's first uh, seasonal forecasts uh, issued in in uh, in early nine maybe in, issued in December 1997. So this was for the 97 98 uh, El, El Nino event. Uh, this is when the IRI uh, forecast division was still at Scripps before it consolidated to to Le Monde. And what you can see here is, I mean, already at that time. Uh, uh, the IRI knew that what it needed to do, if you're if you're making forecasts that are going to be useful to people, is to make forecasts that are, that are in a probability format. So you're giving some you're giving the potential users some estimate of the confidence of your forecast, and so it was done in terms of terciles. So you can see here in in uh, in uh, Eastern Australia here was, there was a a sixty percent probability being forecast of being in the below normal uh, tercile category, uh, 25 in the near normal and only 15 in the above normal. So the IRI has been doing this for a long time, you know, since, since the late 90s and uh, still doing this, in fact. I mean, at the time that was, that was all done, you know, forecasters sat around a bench, that's before my time, and, uh, you know, really drew those lines on, on the maps. But uh, since became, fully objective and automated. And the question is, well, can you do something for sub-seasonal sub forecasts as well? Uh, and actually I was at a meeting, I think it was in 2016, and I think it was Gilbert Brunet who said to me, oh, you know, IRI, you should do this for sub-seasonal forecasts. You've been doing it for seasonal all these years. What about, what about sub-seasonal? So that, so I thought, yeah, well, good point, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, we sort of embarked on on a project with so with no no funding to uh, to to make that a reality, and uh, we since have a, a set of uh, listen in what we call our map rooms, so forecast map rooms, 
uh, and you'll be able to access this. Uh, I'll make a PDF copy available afterwards, but you can you can find our map rooms. And if you navigate to forecasts and, and sub X forecasts, you'll find all of these. And so we have things like uh, uh, precipitation median probability or uh, in, in terms of both weekly and bi-weekly averages going out to four weeks ahead. And this is based on sub X models. So for example, uh, and we have been doing this uh, in real time. And so, you know, that's the IRI thing. It's that you're gonna make forecasts in real time. And so we have been doing this since October, 2017, uh, every Friday issuing these for the upcoming weeks. So the weeks then go from Saturday uh, through, through the following Friday. And uh, here's an example of the one from last Friday uh, for weeks three and four precipitation. So that's for the, the period of 14th to the 27th of August. And uh, precipitation on the left and temperature on the right. So what we chose to do was actually just format it in exactly the same way as the seasonal forecasts were formatted. So that that would be something that users are familiar with and maybe they can you know, get a grasp on what these forecasts are saying. And then we can see, well, uh, you know, is, is what's the information content of these forecasts? Is it similar to seasonal ones? How does it stack up against that? And so for this uh, latter part of August, you can see that uh, it's, it, uh, the forecast, the dominant uh, tersal category is, is the above normal one. Uh, we still have this kind of La, La Nina-ish, uh, we'll have a kind of La nina uh, influence. So there's a, there's a 60, 70% chance of being in the above normal category. Uh, and a lot of regions, you'll see it's just white. So that's equiprobable uh, forecast. These are the, uh, our calibrated multi-model. I'll, I'll tell you what that is in, in a second. Uh, but, but this is, so you'll see there's some regions where there's some color on the map where, we, where the forecast has some, has some sharpness. In the other case, it's just flat, looks like the climatological uh, distribution where where it's where it's white, and then likewise for temperature on the on the right, and then you can see that maybe there's a bit more uh, there's a bit more color over land. We've we've shown it over over the ocean as well uh, for precipitation. So one more thing is that that's just in terms of the uh, those tersile categories, but one thing we've pushed been pushing uh, in terms of you know what can be useful to a user uh, it may not be you know, those, those tersile categories, uh, there's no one size fits all. So uh, what we've been pushing is this, this idea of a flexible format where the, the user can pick their own quantile that they're interested in and see, well, what's the probability of exceeding, exceeding a particular quantile? And so I've shown here for the Asia, Asia region, what's the probability of exceeding the 80th uh, 80th percentile of the, the distribution. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, so over Southeast Asia there, there's some pretty high uh, probabilities of exceeding that much more than the 0.2, uh, that would be the climatological distribution. And then what you can do in this, this map is, uh, really just click on any point on the map. And I clicked on a point over Sulawesi, uh, Indonesian island here. And this is, the, this is what you, you can query the PDF at a point there. And so the dotted line here, uh, well, let's look at the bottom first. There's the, the climatological uh, PDF for that point, uh, peaking at about uh, 20 millimeters per week. But then you can see here in the green line, that's the forecast PDF. And so it's shifted, shifted to the right, a, wet, uh, a wetter forecast. So the, the PDF has been maybe compressed slightly and shifted to the right. And then the user could query this in terms of, well, what's the probability of exceeding uh, 40 millimeters of rain per week? And that's exceeded, that's, that's gone up from a probability of something like, you know, point, point 0.1 up to a probability of point 0.4. So, you know, you could get some, some uh, guidance on, on you know, likelihood of floods, uh, for example, or, you know, droughts likewise, if you looked at the other table of PDF. So how was this made? Uh, as I said, it's made uh, using, using output from sub-X models, and, uh, which we have archived in, in the IRI data library. And uh, 
in order to make this product, what we did was we found uh, three models that all uh, issued forecasts on the same day. So all issue on, on Wednesday, when they, Wednesday starts. The CFSV2 is issuing every day, so uh, that's, that one's easy. And then we've got the, the, uh, the, the NOAA GEFS model and the ESRAL FIM model that we've taken as well. And uh, what we do is we, we do the calibration grid point by grid point uh, on, on, a, on a one degree grid of the, this GPCP uh, precipitation grid. And then for each point, start and lead, uh, we fit a regression model uh, for each model separately. We calibrate each model separately. Uh, we, we make a, a forecast uh, of, of the probability and then we, we make a multi-model average of those, of those probabilities uh, to get the forecasted precipitation uh, at, at that point or, or likewise for temperature. And then the way that we do this, how do we do the, what's the regression model? It's a logistic regression model. So in, in order to, to forecast a probability, uh, we use logistic regression. And the predictor for this regression is actually the ensemble mean of the of the forecast model so we're not using the individual uh, ensemble members we use the, uh, the ensemble mean uh, of of the forecast uh, each model and we actually add another another predictor here a second predictor which is the quantile that we're predicting for and this is what uh, this is the extended bit in the logistic regression and it allows us to make uh, probability forecasts that are consistent uh, for, for different different thresholds. So uh, this is another snapshot of that map room. And if you look, uh, what we have also is if to look back, if you look, choose one that's an older forecast. So this, for example, this is from the 7th of August, 2020, where we have uh, observations for that, for that uh, two week period. We, we can look back and see, well, what was the observed percentile? So plotted on this map for the 22nd of August to the 4th of September, 2020, that's the observed uh, percentile uh, against the, uh, the, uh, the hindcast period of 1999 to 2014. And so I'll draw your attention to a region where the forecasts work well, which was say over Pakistan here. If we look in the Pakistan here, uh, we can see that the, 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 it was heavy rainfall at that time was around about point the, the, the 90th percentile. Uh, if you compare that, that uh, bi-weekly average with the ones from uh, each year from 1999 to 2014. And we had indeed forecast uh, an, uh, a high probability in the above normal uh, category. So that's one, one example where the forecast worked relatively well. Uh, but you can find others where it didn't work as well. So for example, over Indonesia, in this case, I guess we were just around uh, the uh, upper, upper, the 66th percentile, but, but uh, uh, plenty of places where you can see that, well, we did quite well over China, but uh, uh, other places maybe not so good. So you can query this map room, you can go back to 2017, you know, and, and look and if you have an, if you have an event and look how well uh, this, uh, particular MME uh, captured the forecast. So that's one way to, to verify. Another, of course, is to use a skill score. And so we have map rooms for uh, the, the, the rank probability skill score. Uh, and so you can, you can look, look at that by month and by lead time. So this we have weeks two and three and three and four on the right here. Uh, so uh, these are for uh, August starts. And uh, you can see that we do actually very well. We have very high skill scores here, uh, getting up to 0.2. I mean, that's actually quite good for a um, RPSS score. Um, so this is a region where uh, two, two particular drivers come together, S2S drivers of skill, uh, ENSO and MJO. So they're both contributing here uh, to the skill over, over the maritime continent. Uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the dry season here, but you still have good skill. Over India, at weeks two and three, over Northern India, you see there's some skill uh, in, in these forecasts, but it's mostly gone uh, by weeks three and four. Uh, I'll just show you here an example of a particular event. 
a heavy rainfall event over the state of Bihar in northern India in, in 2015. Uh, this, uh, if, you, if you plot an anomaly for that, that weekly period of the, the 6th to 12th July, we, we, had, uh, we had positive rainfall anomalies over in this kind of diagonal band with dry anomalies to the south. And uh, if we look back at the forecast made, what we call the week one from the beginning of that week, or if you go back to week four, you can see that the models do capture this kind of uh, intraseasonal oscillation pattern in that, that, in that case. It was really sort of, kind of a random case that I selected, but I guess we got, got lucky with that one. And you could sort of track that back to a, uh, a very high intensity uh, MJO event over in, in phase seven during that period. Uh, over the over the Western Pacific, and if you look at a uh, a phase composite over over phase seven, you can see this this dipole of the ISO uh, over over northern India that led to this over India that led to this uh, ability to make a forecast at this time. So, I mean, these are really you know forecast forecasts of opportunity, and I think the point to be made is if you use a if you use this kind of calibration to make uh, forecasts. Uh, if you calibrate your forecast, then uh, in times where there's where where there's no uh, signal in the forecast or there's no skill, you will just get the climatological PDF. You should just get the climatological PDF coming out of it. The probabilities of exceedance will just be the climatological ones. Whereas if there is, you know, a, sort of active episode, only then will that climate that forecast PDF deviate from the climatological one. So that, that's the goal of, of, of calibration to enable such forecasts of opportunity to be done really aut automatically. And I'm just showing here that uh, we have these also for you know, week one, week two, and uh, there's much more skill obviously at week one, but you have to make the point that there can be useful skill, uh, say at week two, which might not be uh, the, or even week one for that matter, that might not be in you know what we think of as the S to S forecast range, but th these are formatted in a different way from uh, what we would think of a weather forecast, where you're looking at the forecast each day. Uh, this is using weekly averages, which can be you know useful to certain decision makers to look at. Well, in week one, uh, in terms of the coming week, uh, what's the probability of being above, below, uh, normal, etc., or week two. How does this compare with uh, the, that skill that I'm showing you? How does it compare with IRI's skill for seasonal forecasts? Uh, what I'm showing here is for the Oct August to December kind of period, second half of the calendar year. Uh, on the right here, this is, this is IRI's seasonal forecast skill, again, using this RPSS. Uh, on the left, uh, what we're getting at, at uh, week three and four uh, lead time. So you can see fairly fairly comparable, I guess you'd say, uh, to what we're getting in our seasonal forecast. So I guess this is good news that uh, you know this is just an experimental you know S to S is is, is a is a new kid on the block, and uh, already you could say you know it has similar skill uh, to what we're getting in seasonal forecasts after all these years of doing that. Uh, uh, if you look over India, well maybe we're doing even better here. Uh, the, the seasonal ones at the bottom here, there's basically no skill uh, in, in this period, whereas we, we can see that there's some skill uh, in the week three to four range. So I can see I'm already kind of running behind in my, my uh, presentation, trying to try and speed up a little bit. This is the other thing that I wanted to show you, uh, using these the daily circulation pattern weather regimes uh, as a kind of forecast guidance tool so what we did was to define these these um, uh, these weather regimes from from March to March to sorry from October to March using uh, Z five hundred uh, over this this region uh, North Pacific uh, North America and we we use four regimes here from reanalysis data a West Coast ridge there's a there's a negative NAO pattern in the Atlantic. Uh, we've got a we've got a, a Pacific trough here on the bottom left, on the bottom right, a Pacific ridge, and uh, they have some you know some surface weather expressions associated with them. But the idea here was to 
say, well, can we project our forecast onto these four circulation patterns and get a, a low order depiction of our forecast? And uh, what we did was we used the CFSP2 model because we have a forecast every day from that. Uh, we use a three lagged ensemble uh, average for that. And what we have done is every day uh, to take the forecast in real time from CFSP2 and project it onto those four patterns from reanalysis data and, and show uh, the, the closest one. So uh, what you can see here is we, we do this every day and this is a forecast going out to 45 days and it was closest to West Coast Ridge in the first few days, then transitioned to Pacific Ridge for a few days, uh, going into Pacific Trough, etc. And then the, the saturation here is uh, the, the probability really of being of that assignment to a particular uh, observed regime. So we're not looking at the regimes in the model itself. What we're doing is we're projecting the, the model's own forecast of geopotential height onto those patterns to get a lower order view. So we did that for the whole season and this is what comes out, uh, updating it every day. And then if we look back, we can see uh, if you just look up, uh, basically along the bottom, the, this is the regime, uh, the, the regime sequence uh, that, that was observed in reanalysis data. And so you can see we, we have some sort of intra-seasonal uh, uh, transitions between various regimes here uh, in, the, in the dark blue in the Pacific Ridge regime. And if you look up, you can see uh, how, advanced, how far in advance uh, this was uh, captured in the forecasts. And we can see that, you know, the, these things, the, the band sort of ex extend around vertically around 10 to 15 days. So the skill uh, up to about that far in advance, if you go further in advance, it, it loses its skill. Uh, we would like to see, uh, you know, uh, vertical bands uh, going further up. And so there were no sort of strong episodes where that was the case in this winter although you can find it in other winters. Another thing we did was, well, CFSP2 actually goes out you know, to, to seven months. So why, why, how about if we uh, just show uh, not only the, uh, the first 45 days, but also show uh, monthly averages out to week six. So this is like a seamless depiction where we're showing averages uh, two to three days, four to seven, week two, week three and four. And you can see that what the forecast was showing in the in the in the seasonal range was really going into these uh, ridge regimes, but it couldn't make up its mind between West Coast Ridge and 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 Pacific Ridge. So West Coast Ridge, the the red and the blue, but it was definitely moving into you know because of uh, it, it definitely showing this this um, this 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 pattern. If we look to see the number of days that were, were observed versus, versus forecasted, then uh, we, we can see that uh, in, in the month three, we got a bit, we got too much West Coast Ridge and, and about the right amount of Pacific Ridge. So the, the forecast was fairly accurate in, in that respect, but it couldn't tell uh, which one exactly. So uh, just to summarize, uh, we've been making these routine calibrated probabilistic subseasonal uh, rainfall and temperature forecasts uh, every week based on sub X in real time. Uh, I've shown you those map rooms and then this weather regime tools as a, as a forecast guidance. So a forecaster can really look at that and see well how well is, how well does the model do over the season uh, in, in real time? How well has it been doing up to now? Uh, what's it forecasting in this very low order sense in terms of uh, low order uh, circulation patterns. Uh, it illustrates really the episodic behavior of the S2S scales. Uh, we don't generally see we lose skill after about two weeks, uh, but some of the skill then comes back in the in, in seasonal range. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much, Andrew. So if you have a question, please raise your hand or uh, post it in the chat. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Um, it is 
I really enjoyed your analysis about the regimes and the weather types and um, how the predictability of the regimes um, is, how there's systematic model biases preferring some regimes over others. And I'm wondering um, where would you start um, in model development to address some of these issues you're diagnosing? In model development, I couldn't possibly tell you. I mean, that's that's up to you, model developers, to tell me that. I mean, it's uh, we can. I guess we can. You know, we can give some uh, depiction of what the what the models do, uh, and uh, if when you you know have a, a La Nina event, uh, they they move. You know, we we can see that they uh, very much forecasting these these ridges, but they they, they may not be. Uh, may not be in the, exactly the right place, but if you look in the seasonal forecast uh, for the for the Western U.S., we did quite do quite a good job. You know, the models did a good job of capturing that uh, on, on the seasonal range. On the sub-seasonal range here, uh, not not quite not quite so clear. So I think it's a it's a really it's a hard question to answer. Uh, you know what model developers should look for, but maybe you know some of the things are to look at. Well, what were this can can tell you. Uh, you know what the it can highlight particular drivers. You know it can highlight. You can, uh, you know, relate this this behavior to to Enso. Uh, some of the we've looked back in in previous uh, winters looking at this, and you can relate some of the episodes to the MJO as well. So you know if if something was captured, uh, maybe it you you can relate it or or not captured. It, you can relate it maybe on to to whether or not the, the model captured the MJO and whether or not it captured its teleconnections. And if that gets to some along the lines of what you're asking. Thanks so much. Uh, Will has a question. Will, why don't you mute yourself? Hi, hi Andrew, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was noticing in your extended logistic regression, you're only utilizing the ensemble mean information and nothing with the dynamic ensemble spread. I was wondering if you could talk about what motivated that choice and if there is an actually any skill in the ensemble spread that would assist in the calibration yeah so that's a good question thanks uh in in our work on the seasonal forecasts we've never found any any information in the ensemble spread i think you know the spread skill uh relationships are uh, you know they're, they're they they have value at the weather scale at the seasonal scale, there's, there's not really any ev evidence that there's any any value in that information. Maybe in the subseasonal range, uh, I think it's a, still an open question as to whether there's some spread skill relationship that you could use. You know, if you have a tighter PDF, that you you could really you know uh, make a more confident forecast in that case. So I, I think they call it what heteroscedastic. If you add here, uh, you know, you can add another term for the 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 spread of the of the ensemble that could be included in here. And I, I think some of my RRI colleagues have actually tried that. We, we haven't managed to get any more skill coming out of, out of doing that uh, thus far. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? If not- Yeah, yeah I have one. Did I, I guess they're not coming out of the chat though. It's okay, you don't need to put it in the chat. You can just unmute yourself. Yeah. Or okay. Raise and, your hand. Yeah. Yeah, Andy, I had sort of sort of a practical question actually. I've been wondering about a bit, and I was curious what your take was. Um, do you think that users are are on balance? Obviously, they're individual users, but on balance, are they better served with these uh, routine probabilistic forecasts, um, or uh, maybe more of a sporadic approach where it's sort of a null forecast until there's a quasi-deterministic forecasts of opportunity. So the point I would make is that if these forecasts are, are well calibrated, then you should have a null forecast maybe uh, most of the time. So then you will just be issuing, and the, 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 you know, the user goes to this site and they will see, well, what's the probability uh, of exceeding the, the 80th percentile? It'll just be given you know, by the, the climatological uh, probability of exceeding the 80th percentile. It'll only be, you know, when something's really going on, uh, that you will that this green curve will deviate from the from the from the black one. 
So you know the, the, the calibration needs to be done properly, obviously, for that for that to be the case. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, you know the RPSS. I, it, I, I would say that our forecasts are generally in that, in that in that ballpark. I'm not sure if we've, you know, if if that's if that's fully. But I think that gets to what you're sort of asking, because there's a, it always it's always issued, but uh, uh, it only deviates when something's going on. When we have information to to uh, to con the, the models have in some information to give. Matt, was that a, are you happy? <laughs> uh, well, this is actually very, like I said, this is, it's almost a philosophical question. It's probably better over beer if we ever meet sometime again. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. Pandemic world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, that was a good answer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really like this idea of issuing a climatological forecast unless something is going on. I think that's a really nice way of dealing with this. Um, windows of opportunity that only occur sometimes. Um, I also forgot to say, um, 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 Andrew is also leading one of the tutorials, the Pi weather regime and Pi CPT tutorial together with uh, Angel Munoz. Angel is um, uh, uh, on PTO this week, um, but um, they uh, really worked a lot with the students and uh, made everything available. So thank you so much. Well, yeah, if I could just add to that, yeah, it's been great to see what the students have done. And uh, they have actually been looking at uh, the, these weather regime patterns during the summer uh, season, as well as the other seasons. And I think that's something I only show them for the winter, but you know, it's a question is, 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 is such an approach also be useful in, in the other seasons? So uh, maybe we'll hear some of that uh, tomorrow afternoon or morning. Yeah, exactly. Thanks okay, for Okay, thank that. you again. Yeah.